This episode of the Hope Podcast is brought to us by the Spotlight Project. Uh, the Spotlight Project is a fantastic organization run by fantastic people with the mission of raising employment for individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. They create and sell beautiful jewelry, and each individual they employ uh, has an intellectual or developmental disability and a unique story to tell. You can visit them at the Spotlight Project co.com again the spotlight project code.com use the coupon code hope h-o-p-e again use the coupon code hope for 15 percent off your order a quick disclaimer that this is an authentic conversation um, about anxiety depression and uh, attempted suicide uh, and if you're in need of any help at all uh, please call the national suicide prevention lifeline 1-800-273- 8255 again 1-800-273-8255 uh your life matters i promise you that and with that let's turn it over to steve welcome everyone to this episode of the hope podcast uh, blessed to be joined by one of my oldest friends today uh steve tita um been friends with him since uh before kindergarten uh, our parents were, were friends joined the same beach club the same year and um, and we grew up together, went through, um, went through St. Agnes, uh, together, uh, elementary school. Um, and then, uh, the first few years of high school before, uh, Steve transferred into the local public school and, uh, played sports together, played soccer our whole lives and, and have remained friends. And Steve has quite the story to tell and, uh, quite the philosophy on, on life and, and mental health. So really, really, uh, grateful and appreciative that. Um, he came in to the studio today to, to share his story and, and share some hope with all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Again, it's our pleasure and I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so I guess the best, best place to start is, is at the beginning. Yeah. So if you kind of want to just talk about um, about childhood, maybe uh, family life then, mm-hmm. growing up, friend situations and any stories around that. All right. Yeah, so I mean, my childhood was amazing honestly anything a kid could ask for um super privileged grew up in a nice town um always had awesome friends good family and then i would say around like late fifth sixth grade i started to feel like like looking back i know now it's anxiety but at the time i was like why do i feel so sick to my stomach like i'm so nervous to go to like do things i love like sports so i'd have a lacrosse practice or a basketball practice and i was just like I didn't want to go. I felt so sick to my stomach, and I didn't know why. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't like I had pressure from my family or friends or anyone around me. I think I, I always performed at a relatively high level at that age, and I wanted to like maintain that, and I felt like I wasn't. So I kind of just, kind of just gave me this uncomfortable feeling and made me resent playing the sports. Right. So, at that time, I was kind of just. That was the first dose of my like realizing I had anxiety. And my mom is in this field, so she obviously knew, and she wasn't gonna tell an 11 year old, oh, you're having panic attacks, because they're like, I'm not even gonna know what that is, right? Um, So that's when I started to feel like, okay, maybe I need to like slow down and take a step back and um, like think about what's going on. So I went to therapy, I think I was 13? So it's 12, 13, so middle school age, I started going to therapy, right? Um, was that um, was that your decision or, or your... No, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was mostly... My mom is a, uh, has her own private practice, so she okay. obviously sees her kid having all these uh, like issues and wants him to feel better, of course, mm-hmm. right? So she recommends I go see someone. I, I was open to it, I guess, um, until I got there, and I was like, I, I don't... I wasn't in touch with my emotions, all right? I'm a 12-year-old boy. Like, I don't know anything. Um, but, yeah, it was definitely my, my mom, my family, like, pushing that. When, uh, after my parents got divorced, obviously, I went through a period of very, a very uh, you know, petulant kid and um, right. making a lot of mistakes and um, oh, very angry. And so my um, parents, specifically my mom, definitely, like, pressured me to go to therapy. And, um, you know, I was at that time where anything my mom said, I would say the opposite. Right. And... and you know, go yeah. heavy at it. And so it, it wasn't, um, you know, I eventually did go to a session and I like refused to talk to the guy. And, yeah. and eventually, you know, he said, um, which I remember so clearly, he was like, you know, one day you'll you'll be back here and, and 
you'll be you want to talk and right. uh, you know I hope that day comes sooner rather than later yeah. and he was right um, so you know if you want to talk a little bit about your experience your first experience at therapy and and um, mm-hmm. you know, how it made you feel and, and whatnot yeah so similar to you I think the first like my first um, interaction with the therapist I think it was actually a psychiatrist but either way mm-hmm. um, I was super shut off to it because going into it I was like alright they're gonna go maybe it'll help me like my stomach feel better because that's how my anxiety was manifesting as physical symptoms uh, mm-hmm. at that age but I just would sit there for 40 minutes not saying a word not even because I was like being like a rebellious teenager which I did end up being but um I just didn't know I didn't know what to say anyway so he would ask me all these questions and I was like dude like I just don't want to go to soccer practice like I didn't know how to express how I was actually feeling right mm-hmm. um so he started me on medication whatever I and then after like a couple of weeks I was like I still feel the same way so I just wasn't taking it, and I kept going back, and I just was just lying to the to the psychiatrist, saying like, "Yeah, I'm taking it. It's, I don't really feel any better." Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I stopped seeing a psychiatrist pretty after probably I would say like two or three months, and I was just seeing like a therapist to go talk to. Um, and it took me about I would say a month or two to really like give it a fair shot, um, and not just sit there like a pouty preteen teenager Mm -hmm. so once I would like kind of let my guard down I was able to talk and uh even if it was just about like how my week has been like it didn't I wasn't I wasn't diving into like how depressed I was feeling because I didn't know how to talk about that yet or I was so embarrassed that I felt that way Mm -hmm. Uh, especially since I had a good childhood I had from the outside I had a great life right so it didn't even make sense to me at that age like why do I feel so sad when I have most things a 12 year old 13 14 year old kid would would dream of right Mm -hmm. um so once i kind of let my guard down a bit i got close with this one therapist um she was amazing and she was probably the first she was the first person that made me realize that like okay if i ever do come out the other side from this depression and anxiety i want to be like her right like i want to help people the way she helped me um and it wasn't major things with her because it was more like right it's my first time I didn't know anything she wasn't using any crazy techniques she was more so just like acting as if a second mom towards me because I was that age I I hate my parents right Mm -hmm. like I don't want to listen to you so (laughs) Um, she was a good person to bounce off that like rebellious teen angst like I hate the world everyone's out to get me it's like no you're no one is right Mm -hmm. Um, so she was awesome for that time in my life like I don't know if I'd want to see her when I'm 25 but when I'm 14 she was perfect um, so that opened my eyes to like down the line like this is something I want to be doing and just for myself like I need to be a part of because it it did help even if I didn't see it at the time like looking back it it truly did help me mm-hmm. um, but it took a long time to let her in or let anyone in um, so yeah I don't it's hard that age I think to go the therapy especially when it wasn't my choice necessarily yeah. um, from the outside looking in uh, it was definitely like my first time experiencing uh, mental health with someone you know close to me right. I really didn't understand it um, you know and you said before kid, kids that I do kids are dumb you know 12 or 13 just learn to talk like a few years yeah. ago and, and, and you're just trying <laughs> to figure out life and um, you know Steve Steve was a great athlete and, and um, always had you know a pretty girlfriend and, and just for me it was like a jealous of, of that type of it so i never understood right. like he's struggling i'm like you know why yeah. um and um and if you, if you want to talk a little bit more about like really like yeah. the, the behind you know steve also in and should have mentioned this beginning but in uh school to become a therapist right from uh, one year left one year left to become yeah. a therapist now so if you yeah. want to talk a little bit about yeah. um kind of that perception of, i think a lot of people feel that like my life should be good but i don't feel great right so like i think like now, of course, I see it because you see celebrities, professional athletes, whoever. Like, mental health doesn't discriminate. Like, you could be rich and famous, have everything, and you could still feel that way, right? So, mm-hmm. at that age, 13, 14, I did, I had an awesome life. I, like you said, I was good at sports, had pretty girls, whatever. Um, so, like, everything externally should have made me happy. But still, inside, I was like, I felt empty, nothing. None of that stuff mattered, right? But, so even like my family and to friends, like like you said, it's hard to imagine a kid that has seemingly everything be so depressed and anxious. Um, and I think that's something that like it's getting better now in 2020, but 
so this was like 2010, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, that this whole mental health discussion, it wasn't, it wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. So like, it was a lot more, di more challenging to even tell someone because I felt like if I was going to tell, especially an adult, like, hey, I, I'm feeling a bit suicidal, feeling depressed, whatever, they're going to be like, why? And I'm going to have, I have no explanation. I wasn't like, there was nothing terrible going on in my life at that time um, from the outside to make me really feel that way. But obviously it was just my brain chemistry. It was just all mixed up. My serotonin levels were just super low. Mm -hmm. So I just felt that way. Um, and I think that's something that kids, adults, doesn't really matter what age you are. doesn't matter how good you your life is or how amazing it might seem. You could still feel all of those that same way. And I think it's definitely a hard thing to bring up to people when you, not that it's easier when things like when people know you have a tough life, but when it's seemingly that you have a great life, it's really hard for people to grasp like the understanding of why you, or how you could feel that way. Right. So I think that made it, it made it super difficult for me to even believe that I felt that way. Cause I was like, do I actually feel this way? Like, it's just a bad day. And I'm like, that's a lot of bad days. Like it's more than just a bad day, you know? Um, and eventually I, talked about it with my I eventually just broke down like to my mom I was like I I don't know what the fuck's going on like I'm so sad and mm -hmm. like everything is great so please help um so that was like my first cry for help because I I was sick of feeling sick when, when was uh, when was that that would have been <clears throat> so like freshman year of high school so mm -hmm. 15 um that was when I started to get like a little more like scary scarier thoughts like more towards like being suicidal and stuff uh things like that sure. so, so Stephen, uh you know a, a couple of us from town uh, especially from San Agnes went to the private school in Long Island Chaminade High School which is a very uh, elite school a lot of very very talented uh, athletes and um and very smart kids and um um if you want to talk a little bit more about you know that that time decision to go to Chaminade versus versus Southside and then and just expand more on, on yeah. um, when those feelings started hitting you so I remember the summer going into freshman year of high school so that right after eighth grade pretty much that entire summer i was planning to kill myself before the first day of shamanad i don't know i think i was just this was more like i wasn't actually suicidal i was just i had so much anxiety and fear of starting something new because like at this point i was comfortable at some i knew everybody like my anxiety was there but it, it was controlled because i was in a like an environment of comfort so a new shamanad like being a new kid um and like a big a small fish in a big pond type thing and I was just like I was terrified mm -hmm. so that whole summer was when I was really getting those first like suicidal ideations in a way and then starting at Shamnad, the first like trimester I would say was awesome because we played soccer like and we became friends with all those guys and that was a ton of fun I thought because mm -hmm. um, originally I didn't I didn't want to go to Shamnad. it was more like my parents were like you're gonna go if you don't like it We'll see what happens right. and I was like fine because I knew they were so good at sports so I was in a way and all of our St. Agnes friends were going so right. it was still better um, than going to Southside at the time right but so after the first trimester I would say um, it's one sock pretty much when soccer was over I was like that winter period um, that's usually when I get more depressed anyway like not like tons of other people right. um, I kind of was just like I hate this place I, I hated how strict it was at being 15 like now I work there it's really not that strict but like being a 15 year old right. kid I was like what do you mean you have to come in here and do all this stuff <laughs> right. I was like alright um, <clears throat> but that was when I, I finally I was really like in a bad place um, because there was no sport at the time I wasn't playing like basketball for them or anything so the winter was kind of like a just a dull period for me um, and I was just getting home it was dark and my parents were both working, not that it's had anything to do with like, being their fault, but like I was just alone, sure. and I kind of just started getting into my head. Um, and then following the winter, that's when my grades started to slip because I was so depressed. I couldn't, I had zero motivation to do any work. Um, like the cross season started, so that was fun, but it wasn't the same, right? So I was, I was so depressed at that point that all the sports and friends, nothing made me feel good, really. Like. I was kind of just going through the motions and doing like minimum of everything, mm -hmm. uh, barely passing, barely, you know, kind of just scraping by. Um, 
And at, at Shamna, like you said, it's such a like a prestigious school. Um, I felt like it was super hard to open up to anyone at the school, and like I didn't want to open up really to my parents at the time because I was a kid, and it's like just un- everything is just uncomfortable mm-hmm. at that age. Um, so I just felt very I was very alone in my head, um, which is the worst place to be for mm-hmm. myself at least. Um, and I think once the following the sophomore year but right before I left that was when I was like all right this is getting like really scary because I wasn't on medication I wasn't going to therapy at that point and I was just like going downhill fast so my idea my fantastic idea was let's start like smoking weed and drinking and like when I do those things I feel awesome so let's just keep doing that all the time um bad idea uh just made me way more depressed obviously um and then I was kind of purposely also not intentionally failing out of Shamanad so I could go to public school. Um, so that was like the, the fall of sophomore year. And once that was about to happen, once the school like reached out to my parents, like he's gonna like, he has to leave, like he's gonna fail out. Um, he's not doing any work. Mm-hmm. And then that's when the transition happened going to Southside. I was like, this is gonna be, my life's gonna change, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm gonna be so happy. I can't wait, and that uh, like level of anticipation or excitement to go to that school was ultimately the pitfall of my life. That like for the next few years, like that, what I thought was going to be the best turning point in my life ended up being potentially the worst. Not because it's the school's fault, but me at the time, in combination with a transition period, was a cocktail for disaster. Like it right. couldn't have couldn't have been worse. Uh, but yeah, I can talk about once that happened if you want. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. No, I just, I just my, my perspective. I remember, um, you know, from the outside looking in, and people out there, you think you're, you know, you're, you're friends, if you're at that age, and you think your friends might be struggling with things similar. Um, it's difficult to know how to approach people because I remember mm-hmm. I knew I definitely knew at the time this was like fall of sophomore year during our soccer season. I definitely knew at this point that you know you you had um, your issues and. Right. Um, it definitely wasn't something you were super open with, um, you know, with, with I think most people, but definitely wasn't with me. But I remember selfishly thinking like, um, you know, I hope you, you know, stay, you finish out the soccer season yeah. or I want you to stay because you were yeah. so good at soccer and we're a good asset to our team. And, um, you know, you know, you can't go back in time, but I would, you know, if I could, I regret not being more of like a friend and being like, hey man, how are you? What's yeah. going on with you? Like, like and stuff like that. Um, and it's so important to ask people how they're doing and like right. genuinely care um, about them as opposed to the selfish reasons you want mm-hmm. um, them around. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, if you definitely want to talk about the transition to South South yeah. period. And like just touching on what you said, like I wasn't open at the time. So I think even if like, even if you were like asking, I don't know if I would have said anything cause it was kind of just like, I didn't know what, what am I supposed to say? Right. You know, it was just a weird age, um, and that was when the time we like you wanted to be cool, so we were partying, or like smoking weed and drinking, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, drinking right. natty lights. Yeah, at, yeah. At the bridge. Yeah, exactly. It's all six of us. Yeah. So once <laughs> once I transferred to Southside, because I was kind of like, I had so much anxiety. Just the, a transition for me in general, like even now, like when I'm doing great, like if I am a new environment, a new whatever, like I'm gonna have natural anxiety, right? So this right. was just like exponentially more anxiety than it would be for me normally. Um, New school, I obviously had friends at the school, like it's our town, so I knew a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But it's it's different when you are like coming in the middle of soccer season for them and I'm, who's this new sophomore is coming in and they're like, who who the fuck does this kid think he is? Like, and my whole thinking and my parents thinking was like, "He'll, he'll transfer in, like he won't play soccer, it'll just be like a nice relaxing, like, easy transition um <clears throat> but the day that i was like going to tour the school with my parents like the soccer coach at the time comes out of his classroom like stops his teaching his math class stops the te- uh teaching to come talk to me and like pretty much is like you're gonna be on the like varsity and i was like great this, this is a this is a fucking disaster <laughs> part of me is like excited because i'm still a kid and i love soccer so like this i'm like this is awesome like this could be a way for me to like maybe i'll start feeling better um so that happens my mom's like oh fuck here we go like she knows she knows it's happening um it's like from the outside being a professional in the field 
So then that once he says that and I jump onto the soccer team, it quickly went down for me. Because uh, I was already like smoking and drinking, whatever. But now that I'm at public school and not Chaminade, I can smoke during the week. Like I can, you have to leave school for 40, 60 minutes, whatever, whatever it is for your free period. Obviously, Chaminade, you have to eat at school. Like that's, you don't leave until the end of the day. Right. Um, so I could smoke weed, come back, go to class, high off my ass, like I'm, obviously not learning but that's beside the point mm-hmm. um, it was more so that now I had so much more freedom I guess to kind of dive into those bad those bad habits uh, and I think not that it was like the people I was hanging out with, it was just the way that public school worked like you could get away with doing more stuff like that than at Shamanad. right um, so I was hanging out with like older kids whatever and just playing soccer and then um I think I started to like play a lot and that really pissed people off. Like <clears throat> parents of some of the seniors that had like, my kid's been here for four years, whatever. So like I, I was playing like the second game I was on the team. They were like, all right, she's going to go in, whatever. And it's not like I was doing anything crazy. I wasn't like scoring a bunch of goals, but obviously I was good enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew that, but that made me feel like such shit because I felt like, these kids don't even really know me and they're not going to like me already because I'm like taking a chunk of their playing time, whatever it is. Right. So I kind of just like, I had a back injury, right? So I, I, I uh, separated myself from that whole drama because I was like, you know what? It's not fucking worth it. I'll play next year. Um, so that was kind of my way of dealing with this, the whole, the anxiety of the soccer. Yeah. Um, but as I stopped playing, I was able to, like I was skipping practices to go smoke and just like, it kind of just went, it escalated very quickly for me yeah. with uh, mostly at that time just smoking and drinking. But as like we go further into the story, it was gets very quickly. It turns more than that. Yeah, uh, just just to touch on one thing, like it's just so powerful, like um, that you know that how much humans want to fit in with a group and how powerful like social connections are. That to the point where you know you're a great soccer player. I'm an asset to that team. Like yeah. it would have been helpful to have you on the field and, and in your own head, a thought, a strong thought that you had was I'd rather, you know, not play. I'd rather kind of emphasize this injury. Yeah. So I fit in with the people more and don't piss them off and like, and just, just kind of fit in with the group more. Yeah. And, um, even though that definitely wasn't in the best interest of the team, yeah. you, <laughs> it definitely was not in the best interest of you personally. I mean, it's, it's, it's I mean, yeah. um, but there's the pressure you felt from other people to do something that wasn't in your best interest so you could fit in. I think that's relatable for so many people Definitely. out there. But if you want to touch on um, kind of going forward in high school and when things started really, um, really yeah. escalating. Yeah, so that, once I stopped really playing, because I think there was probably about, I don't know, a quarter or half of the season left when I kind of was like, right, I'm really not playing anymore. Mm-hmm. I was just, I was going to practice to watch, whatever. Excuse me. Um... But I wasn't playing, obviously. Mm. So that year, they actually won county. So like that was cool. But like I wasn't. It didn't. I I didn't win county. So I didn't feel like I was a part of it because I came late. I stopped playing. It was more like I was there. Um, but once that the soccer season ended, I have I don't know three four months until lacrosse season would start at the time. So I had a bunch of free time after school, and that's when it was like seven days a week smoking weed tons of weed every day and then I don't know if it was would have been right around like Thanksgiving that sophomore year someone uh like had Oxycontin at a party or like we were just smoking and someone's like well let's try this with it or whatever so I did that and I was like wow this is fucking amazing like I've never felt so little pain before like I felt amazing um for 20 minutes and then um that was when it kind of got scary for me because I was like, and my my dad had a bunch of knee surgeries from years ago, um, and like there was a bunch of pills in the house still, even though they were like old and expired. But I was just eating those like they were Tic Tacs in class, um, and buying them from a kid at school all the time. I'd just be like in third period eating like three oxys and then falling asleep pretty much all of class. Um, and that went on for probably not that long, but like three months or so. I was, that's kind of my life. I was just smoke weed after school, smoke weed during school, take a few pills during school, 
and that was just like just a zombie through through that uh period but the weekend before christmas was like i don't know december 15 16 something like that um was the first time that i was like i can't do this anymore so i took all my dad's pills and i took all of them um it was like i don't know 15 20 oxycontins which if they were if they hadn't been like five years expired there was no shot you like wake up from that Mm -hmm. um so luckily thank god um they were expired so they didn't if anyone doesn't know when they're expired like they're not as potent so they were pretty much just made me incredibly sick i've never been so sick in my life i threw up for about three days um just straight like all the pills obviously um but that was my first like serious attempt to end my life and probably the most serious honestly ever um and that little stint I didn't tell, like, no, my parents just thought I was, like, super sick. Mm -hmm. Like, I got some bad stomach bug or something. But then I told my sister, because I I just, at that point, I just needed to tell somebody, like, look, I'm struggling here. Like, and obviously my parents knew, but they didn't know to what extent, because, like, I I got good at putting on a face that I was, like, yeah, I'm happy. Um, So I told my sister, thank God, because then she told, she's like, my older sister's not going to, not tell my mom like oh by the way your son tried to kill himself like that's kind of big deal right. um but in my mind i was like she's not gonna tell anyone like i'll be fine so she tells my parents and then they send me to like a to just like a psych ward in uh zucker hillside hospital or whatever they had like a adolescent it's hard for being that age because most places won't take kids mm-hmm. so they had a, if you were under 18 some like 12 to 18 so i went there that was like my first time going going away uh even though it was like five days but i went there for like a week or so just to stabilize me get me on meds um and that was probably the biggest mistake that i would i would uh, argue that my parents would say was the biggest mistake they made because at the time now it's like a nice place like it's beautiful but when i went it was like the shit you'd see in a movie like it was run the fuck down um it was just a scary place for essentially a child like i'm 15 so like I, I don't know what the fuck is going on. I'm in this place with people that scare the shit out of me. Um, so, like, borderline traumatized from that. Yeah. So, once I get out, it's like, I don't know, January, January, February. I still have no sports or anything. And it's not like my life changed. I went right back to school and lived my life. And that was when I started, like, I wanted to forget that I was there. So, I was smoking, drinking, taking pills, like, all the time. Uh for the rest of sophomore year, basically, until uh, middle of lacrosse season that spring. So after, like, following going to the hospital, um, I kind of, well, that lacrosse season was like the best season I had of my high school career because I didn't fuck with. I stopped like doing the the drugs. I was still smoking, but uh, there was no more pills or anything. So I played well that season. I was, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna. This is like another turning point. I'm gonna be good again Mm -hmm. um because i did genuinely i i was pretty happy at that time like i felt good about what i was doing like being doing well on the team and not being like like it wasn't like i was like the best player so there wasn't this crazy pressure like i had to do all this work it was more like i'm just a part of something um which was awesome for me at the time um so that went well and then once that ended again it was the summer i don't i don't think i was working if i was i wasn't going um, and that it, the cycle just came, I went right back to this is summer, what I was summer going into summer year. going to junior year yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so that was kind of how it went when I transitioned from Shamnad to the so south side I thought it was going to be amazing when in reality staying at Sham like looking back and now that I've like I worked there for a few years like I needed I was a kid that needed the structure so I think like for any parents that have a kid that's similar to how I was as much as like you want to listen to your kid or tell them like, oh, it's gonna like, maybe you maybe it would be better for him to be in an environment like that. At least for me, like I need I was someone who needed someone to be on my ass. Like, do you need to do all this work? Otherwise, you're you're fucking out of here. Because mm-hmm. um, once if I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do at that age was not good. So right. I, I mean, it's a mistake looking back. Like I wish I could have. St- I wish I would have stayed. Like I wish sixteen year old me, fifteen year old me was smart enough to be like big picture this is going to be so much better for you but obviously it didn't work out the way 
and everything happens for a reason and now it's worked out but yeah and so that's what it's so it's so hard to look back and we all want to look back and be like i wish i'd done that wish i'd done that but like when you go back and actually put yourself in those shoes like you like physically couldn't yeah. do shamana because you were the feeling you have the depression the anxiety it's like yeah it actually like like paralyzes you to the point where you can't do the work it's not that you're not intelligent enough to do it clearly yeah. you are right um and clearly you have the work ethic to do it mm-hmm. um but your your brain chemicals and and it paralyzes you and it's yeah. that's why it's you know it's a disease and we have to look at it like a disease like any other disease and talk about it like a disease um, and that's why we have to talk about it in general yeah. so that people can hear this especially kids out there who are struggling with it like um thank god steven told uh his sister um told someone uh, even though maybe the psych ward wasn't the best avenue, um, which is another you know another topic we talk about because I've heard that from other people that that they've been put in these psych wards for for things and come out you know they're with schizophrenia schizophrenic patient they're treated like schizophrenic patients yeah. and then they start feeling like schizophrenic patients start telling themselves they're schizophrenic yeah. and then all of a sudden all of a sudden they're schizophrenic yeah. um, but that's you know that's a conversation for another day but. Um, <laughs> so important to talk about these things have someone to open up with a sister a friend you know take have the courage to to go to therapy and and talk to the therapist and um yeah if you just want if you want to keep expanding on on the story from there yeah so junior year uh fall of junior year i was doing what i was doing in the summer continued i was just doing a bunch of drugs drinking a lot whatever like thought I was hot shit because mm-hmm. I was like, look at me. I got a hot girlfriend. I'm doing drugs. Like, I'm the fucking man, right? 16-year-old asshole. Um, but I had like a few weeks, like a month or so into this, into the soccer season of my junior year. I thought it would be a good idea to take a bunch of Xanax in one of my off periods. Um, it was like, I don't really know. Like, looking back, it's hard because I don't remember doing it. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if I was like, it was like a kind of an overdose, but not really. Like I just took like way too many. Mm-hmm. So I went in back into school. I remember a friend seeing me before I walked into the building was like, Stephen, like you should really not go in like that. You look awful. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so I go in and I have, thank God I had one of like my coolest teachers, the period, like the period after, like he knew what the fuck was going on with me. Like I was pretty close with him. But uh, even he was just like, Dude, like this is not good. So I'm I'm f- passed out in class because I took too much Xanax, right? So the I think the dean or the principal, whatever whatever she was at the school, was in the back of their class and just like taps me on the shoulder after that period is over and is like, come with me. And like I'm I can't even walk. I'm walking into walls. I'm like delirious of what's going on, right? People are probably like, what the fuck? Mm-hmm. Um. So like. They take me to the nurse, or whatever. Um, try to like calm me, like get me awake, basically. Um, they eventually do, but that ends up just suspending me from school for five days, right? So I get, um, I've never had detention. I've never gotten in trouble once in my life, and all of a sudden I'm fucking suspended from from school. So I immediately kicked off the soccer team, obviously. Um, which is my junior season, which was supposed to be like my big season. Like I'm gonna do. I was like in great shape at the time. I was gonna be like probably the peak of my like athletic ability. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they, the school suspends me. The rule is you get kicked off the team if you get suspended. Makes sense, right? Um, so once I had to go to some like daycare um, for five days. It's like is this like the thing that they send all like the yeah, yeah. miscreants to? Like, yeah. It's like so it's me and like just dungeon. a bunch of kids that are like have all been suspended or like if you get expelled, you go to it's called like I think it's called the greenhouse. Or something. It's it was literally underneath like a soccer state, a uh, soccer station, like soccer <laughs> store. So where I go get my cleats, the woman who like I'm friends with the person who owns that store, and she's like, "What the fuck is going on right now?" Yeah. But yeah, so I had to go there for five days, and you don't learn shit there. You're just there for a few hours a day. Like you have to show up basically, otherwise I don't know. They would extend your suspension, whatever it would be. Right. So I did my five days, little slap on the wrist, um, and that didn't change shit. Like it kind of. My parents were pissed, but like. I don't know. There was nothing they could really do at that point. Um, so I, and I just, I started going back to school. I wasn't on the soccer team, obviously. And that, I just continued doing what I was doing um, for months and months and months. And then junior year, spring, uh, lacrosse season was happening. I was like, 
that was my big year. I had already committed to Fairfield for lacrosse by then. Right. Um, so like that winter or that fall, I committed there, I think, to Fairfield. And then <laughs> halfway through junior year, because I had been doing the same thing, right? So eventually I was like, wow, I can smoke and take pills and still play amazing. Like, this is so easy. Mm-hmm. Eventually he caught out to me, right? So I was just like a fucking mess. And all my coaches knew it. They were like, what? They could like look into my eyes and I was just dead. Um, so halfway through lacrosse season, um, I, my parents sent me to like a, a 28 day program in Connecticut, a place called Silver Hill. It's fucking incredible facility. It's like where like celebrities go. So again, super privileged where I got to go to like the best of the best places to get help. And I still was like, fuck you. I don't like, I don't belong here. Like I don't need this help. Right. Um, so I was there for about five weeks, I think. And as much as I was like against it and like uh, trying not to buy into what they were selling there with the therapy, it did help me like a lot. Um, what were they trying to sell you? It there? was so I, when I was there, as I didn't mention this, but I had been like um, I'd been cutting myself a lot and just like just self harm behaviors in general um, on top of attempted suicides. So it was like, it's called DBT, so Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. It's mm-hmm. it's aimed mostly at like people with borderline personality disorder or people that are um, like self-harming to stop those behaviors essentially. Um, and primarily like adolescents, it's super good for them. And it, it did help, like I, uh, it's all about just learning different coping skills. And as much as I hated it, I did use them. Mm-hmm. Um, Eventually, after a couple of weeks being there, you're kind of like, I have nothing better to do here. I'm stuck here. I might as well, like, kind of let let some of the information soak in. So for about five weeks, I was in, like, it was a super intense, like, pretty much job, like, nine to five, learning different skills and coping mechanisms to deal with my, my thoughts and feelings and trying to cut out those, like, super negative behaviors, like cutting. Um, but that, ultimately, I, I, I got out of there and... I was good for, I don't know, a couple of months or so until I, I fell back into the same cycle. But I think that was when, I didn't mention this before I went, sorry, but um, that was when people started to see like what the fuck is going on with this kid. Cause I was hiding, like I was hiding the doing, taking pills. Or like at this point I was more so just smoking weed, right? So I, he's just a pothead, fine. Um, but like once I was cutting myself, it was like my coaches were like, what the fuck? Like, you know, it's weird to see, not weird, but it's it's hard to see a 16-year-old kid, 17-year-old kid that you think of as, like, whatever, a popular athletic kid, and he's got slashes all up his wrist, and you're like, okay, something is super fucked up here. Um, and my friends, I like, were great, honestly. I remember a couple times I was talking to, like, my girlfriend at the time saying scary shit, like, you don't want, you don't want to hear as any, any person wants to hear that stuff. Um, so they came, like, picked me up and, like, got me food and shit. Like, I hadn't eaten for days. Like, I was just cutting myself. It was just, a, it was just bad. Um, so I had people that... This is when I first saw people really, like, gave a fuck about me. Mm-hmm. More so than just, like, oh, he's on my team. Or, like, you know what I mean? Like, I always knew I had friends, but it it takes, like... Sometimes it takes thing, situations like that to really see, like, who your real friends are. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, that was, like, the time when I was like, all right, these are people that actually, like... They really do care, um, which actually helped a lot in the long run for right. me. Um, but yeah, I think that was that was the hardest point for me because that one, it was no longer like my big secret, where it was like, all right, now everyone knows that this kid that seems like yes, everything is really not good. And then you hear all these rumors, like all this bullshit, like oh. He, there's nothing wrong with him. Like, he just wants attention. I'm like, I get plenty of attention. I want the opposite. I want to blend in, like, the girl over there that no one notices, you know? Like, I just want to be invisible. Um, but it was also, again, much easier looking back. Like, that was my, like, I need help. Like, look at what I'm doing to myself. Like, someone please fucking help me. Um, and I had teachers, my parents, like, family. Everyone was there to help, uh, thank God. And that's that's ultimately, like, what led me to go away. It was... uh like all the cutting and shit. I didn't mention it before, so I wanted to get that out there. That uh, That's what made everyone see, because I still wasn't talking about it. Right. Um, 
as was, was that kind of the, the you think the reason why you were were doing it, or was it more that you you wanted to feel the pain or a little bit both? I think part in the beginning it was like um, the way my depression was manifesting. I felt just I felt nothing. Like it got to the point where I wasn't even so sad anymore. I literally didn't feel anything like joy, excitement. Like not, I felt zero emotions. So I started cutting to see if like. I think if I feel pain, like I'm still, I feel something, right? Um, so that's how it was initially. And then I kind of started to like, I almost got like addicted to it. Like I almost just like enjoyed it. Like mm-hmm. it felt good, which is fucking sad to say. But uh, for that time, it felt good, good to do it. Like it was like a relief. It was like, I don't know. It was almost like the equivalent of getting high at the time. Like it felt, that's how it felt for me. And then I think eventually though, it was to get like, someone to be like okay like he needs help with because i couldn't i was too i had too much pride or whatever it was to go actually ask for that help that i needed so this was like a way for me to get that help and mm-hmm. someone to be like all right we need to he needs to go see someone or go away whatever it is um yeah obviously looking back i can say that but at the time it's hard, i think it was more so like i just hated myself and i was like this is what i'm gonna do yeah yeah so at the time it, it it probably the, may not have been a reason in your head. It may have just yeah. been like, like... I was just impulsive. So right. I was like, I want to do this. I did it. Mm-hmm. Same with drugs. Like, I didn't really like them. I just like, I'm going to do it. Right. right. And then it becomes a habit. And yeah. then it becomes a habit. It just becomes part of, part of your personality, who you exactly. are. And um, I think um, at this point, I was at Chaminade. You were at Southside with everything going on. We are hanging out with different friend groups. So definitely yeah. weren't as close to this, this time period. But certainly I was, um, you know, would, would hang out with... with your friend group every once in a while and see yeah. you and and definitely from the outside looking in it's like from that perspective how do you help you know i yeah. i'm like um what can i do am i even a good enough friend where is it is it like now that all this is coming out having you know, like been having been close, as close with him like is it gonna seem like i'm just trying to get like attention for him yeah. from him to do to ask for help and i think that the answer for that is that if your friend's going through something and you know, and you're hearing rumors and, and you know, first of all, you know, c- cut the rumors off when you hear them, say that's bullshit. Yeah. And second of all, say, hey man, I haven't talked to you in a while, how are you doing? I, I wish I could go back again, I regret that I, I didn't do that. Right. Um, but I'm so, I, I'm so grateful that, you know, a lot of those guys are great guys, that the Southside guys and yeah. uh, people like Tommy Ahern yeah. uh, were there for you and, and um, because it's so powerful human connection and having people there for you is, um, for, you know, my experience has gotten me through every tough situation I've ever been in. Mm-hmm. And just, it's um, um, so important. Absolutely. I can't do, can't do half this life stuff alone. No, I really can't. Not. Especially when you're struggling. You can't do it alone. Let's, uh, I'm just going to take a cut of everything and then do like a part two because this is like really fucking powerful.